Hi, I'm Tom Miggett from Tom Miggett Photography and this is another episode of Capture It With Tom Friends. And uh, well, today my friend is a famous photographer and got even more famous, some would say, uh, over the past few months. As everybody suddenly realized a weird story that happens uh, quite some time ago but got published in the newspaper over the past two months. And that's David Slater. Hey David, how are you? I'm out fine, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, well, you're welcome. Uh, for those of you who've been following me, uh, you um, may remember I did a video uh, in back in August uh, as I discovered uh, the story about David and this incredible story, I would say, uh, about the uh, macaque picture that he took. Did I say it right? He took it. He owns it. He's the responsible guy for it. Fuck the macaque, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Excuse my French. <laughs> so, uh, that video generated quite a lot of reaction from you guys, uh, a lot of support uh, toward David. Um, and I wanted to uh, I reach out to David as soon as I actually published the video. Uh, I was hoping to uh, get a chance to speak to him, get his version of the facts, uh, because all we know about the story is what, we, uh, what was portrayed in the uh, newspapers, uh, including the Daily Mail, and for those of us who happen to live in the UK, we surely know how reliable the Daily Mail is. So that'd be great to have uh, your side of the story, David, uh, and uh, what comes next with this story as well. On the screen here, uh, what we have, we have your new um, website that's been refurbished, and there is currently an offer as well I'd like to, uh, to talk about to get this uh, this canvas, which I'm going to get, actually, as a matter of fact, so I'm I'm saying it loud, I'm going to get it, and uh, I will show it to everyone once I receive it. Um, but before we dive into this monkey business of yours, I would like to know a little bit more about you. Who is David? Is uh, What was David doing before the macaque? Uh, what's your inspiration? What's your uh, what's your background? Uh, what's your goals? Uh, what moves your boat? Uh, and potentially what gear you use? And then after moving to this macaque thing, is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll try my best. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, uh, photography has been with me for for a long, long time. It's from a schoolboy. Um, I, I joined a mountaineering club. We did photography competitions. That everybody had cameras, and that's when I picked a camera up. Um, it sort of waned a little bit when I went to university, um, although I, I became a mountaineer and a rock climber and I took photography up then, hanging on ropes, taking pictures of people. Um, I did a, a, a postdoctorate, a doctorate, a postdoctorate, it all went um, to, to the wind. Um, and it's only since I left university when I became unemployed that I, I was fortunate enough to have my car stolen and the insurance money uh, paid me enough to get my first camera. And I spent two years of my unemployed time taking pictures. And in 1997, a very serendipitous uh, picture of a grass snake swimming through water won me a prize in the Wildlife Photography of the Year contest. And that's where it all kicked off. That's when interest in me began. Wow. So what what is it really? I mean, a lot of us uh, really are, are are really admiring uh, wildlife photographers and the, and the work they produce, but it's always... For a lot of us, we always wonder, well, how do we dive in this? How, how can we make it a business? How can we, where do we start? Uh, well, I think I've already given the clue away. I think you've got to get a profile. You've got to take your images to magazines or enter competitions. And hopefully you, you, you win or win us up in a competition. And your peers get an interest in you. And, you know, the press, uh, agents start to approach you. Mm. And I think it all kicks off from there, really. Okay. And so why... Why white life? They, are you, aren't you, I mean, I've seen your work, and we're, we're, we're actually going through it at the moment as I speak, but why not portrait photography? Is that something that you do? Interested at all? Not at all? Um, yeah, well, I've, I've, I've dabbled in all, all aspects of photography. Wildlife was the sort of the, the passion when I was at school, and, and mountaineering, the outdoors, uh, natural history. Um, at university, I was a geologist, and that's my degree. Um, so I've always been outdoorsy. I've never really wanted to, to be indoors as a, as a career. But yeah, I've tried uh, weddings. I've tried baby photography, still life. But the passion, you know, what, what, you know, wildlife photographers will, will agree with me that it's, it's something in your heart. Hmm. It requires a lot of um, passion, but also a lot of patience as well, right? 
<laughs> yes. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's like the the, the, the trip um, with with a monkey photograph. You know, it, it, every now and again you will get those that one shot that sells and the, that does something for you. But the, but the patience to get that one shot can last a year, two years. So I, you know, I'm out generally every day, like most wildlife photographers, up up, up early or, or out late. Um, you've got to learn your subject. You've got to sit patiently, get cold. Um, it's a lot of time, a lot of money. Um, and when the photograph does come along, like the monkey shot, um, you want to make uh, as best capital of it as you can. Mm. So how much how much planning did he go in the um, in that trip to make that shot of uh, of, of the macaque or that, those shots? Because there's more than one. Uh, that whole experience. Well, um, no, well it. it Actually, the part where the monkey is uh, was only a three-day trip, um, but it was part of a wider trip that was over three weeks, where I travelled all around Sulawesi from the south, southeast corner, southwest corner, and eventually ended up in that national park in the north. Um, I'd thought about it for a long time. I joined conservation groups and helped out with surveys and helped them with the photography. So that was the whole package, really. Um, but I'd always seen these pictures of the Sulawesi crested macaque, and they're called crested for a good reason, with a crest, very charismatic, very strange, especially when, you know, if as old as me, and you, you remember the, the punk hairdo, <laughs> um, and, and the piercing red eyes, I thought they were so human-like, I'd always wanted to see them, I, I was fascinated by the pictures that I saw, so I took the opportunity when I was over there to take extra flights and extra time out of my trip to go and see them and see what I could do. Mm. So what what gear do you use? I mean, I, I keep telling my students that photography is not about gear. Uh, it's the, the the best gear is the one you have, obviously, uh, mm. with you. Uh, but what gear do you uh, do you rely on? on well, I'm a Canon user. I've been a Canon user for quite some time. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to get hold of a very cheap six hundred mil f four lens, cheap as in a few thousand pounds instead of eight or nine as they are now. Um, I've got a Canon 5D camera body at the time. That's another grand for that. And a lot of peripheral lenses. Um, so, yeah, a Canon, uh, but it isn't the gear, like you say. Uh, all of my camera equipment is broken. Some of the things don't focus. I have to manual focus them. Uh, sometimes the flash guns don't work, you know. Um, but I battle through. And, and I think when you work around problems, it, it helps you in the long run with your photography. Mm. So that leads us to this um, macaque thing. And um, can you tell us your version of it? Of what, what happened from the moment you actually show up there in front of the beast? Well, obviously, I'd, I'd gone there with a specific intention of, of, of making a conservation story. They're endangered, these uh, little black monkeys. Um, and I wanted a portrait. Um, the National Park is wild. It hasn't got a fence around it. And you are required to have a ranger accompany you. So <clears throat> on the first day, well, I, when I, I arranged with the ranger to, to, to be there for three days. He, he agreed. He spoke very little English, but he, he did agree. Um, um, by the first day, I'd, I'd, I'd only got the, the standard sort of stock shots of, of, the, of the monkeys through long lenses, etc. But at the end of the first day, I suppose we're starting to, to befriend them. And come the second day, um, we, we'd gone there uh, in the morning, and I'd started to follow a troop around. And so much so that by midday, after a few rests and a few grooming sessions, they'd actually started to groom me. Um, they started to show a lot of interest in my camera. And at one particular point, I thought um, I'd better get a picture of me with the monkeys. <laughs> so I put my camera down on a self-timer on a log. They were all sitting at the time. Uh, they were totally confident with me by this time. Um, so I set the camera up on a self-timer log, and I had to keep running around the, the other side of the log and try to get me with all the monkeys around me. And yes, the, the camera would, would, would fire. And that would only pique the interest of one little monkey on the log who eventually came and grabbed the camera. Um, he grabbed the camera, he went on the other side of our guide to try and uh, a, a catch the monkey, at which point my guide, um, by, by this time actually, my guide had got so bored with the old event, he'd gone off for sleep and smoke. But uh, the noise of me trying to chase the monkey, he woke, woke him or something and he appeared and he actually got the camera back off the monkey. Mm. The camera was very big, by the way, compared to the monkey. It couldn't, it, you know, it wasn't just a little mobile phone or anything. 
So it's very easy to get the camera back. Um, and in trying to get the camera back off the monkey, some shots were being fired. It seemed to be interested in the button and the noise of the shutter. Um, but we got the camera back, and I looked at, the, I looked at the images, as I always do, and they were rubbish. They were all out of focus. I deleted them. Um, but to me, that over time, I wanted this full face portrait of, of the monkey with its piercing red eyes looking straight down the lens, and it was a photograph that wasn't materialising. I could do it through a long lens, but I wanted it close up in, the, in a wide-angle lens. So it appeared. So it occurred to me very sort of slowly that if I was to put the camera on a tripod, and, and that was the reason for them not. I, I did it so they couldn't steal the camera again, um, and put a cable release on it. If I could get them to touch the cable release and start squeezing the cable release, it would make the noise that peaked the monkey in the first place, and they'd look into the lens and take their own photograph. Um, it took a while, but they actually did it. Um, but, the, but but what? But, but, People have to realise there's two parts of the story. There's an, an, an early part where the monkey grabbed the camera and the picture came to nothing. And there's a second part where I, I visualised an image and I made creative moves towards getting that image. Now, when I came back um, from the trip, um, an agent me and saw the pictures on my website. He said, these look very interesting. Can you tell me the story behind them? So we had a conversation. He, he went with the story. And straight away, within the hour, uh, I was agreeing what the words would be. Um, three papers picked it up. The Daily Mirror, The Sun, and the, day, uh, the Daily Mail. And all three of them relied upon a press release that my agent had written. And it was a fun story, and in true journalistic fashion. And it was no problem to me at the time. Um, they embellished the, 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 the quotes a little bit, started switching the quotes around, and they condensed the story. I mean, I've said a long, quite a long story to you. People get bored with that. So <laughs> they put them together, and basically they, they tried to say that the, that the monkey ran off with the camera and took a self-portrait. How long time? How long ago was that? Was a, the story was in 2011, um, but, the, but it'd been on my website sometime before that. Um, but, that, but, that, but that, that really isn't the point. Is that the point is that the, the, the press picked the story up and embellished a little bit. It was fun. Nobody was pro had a problem with that. We didn't realise at the time, neither me and my agent realised that a copyright issue would arise because I, I, then, as now, I believe I have copyright with all the work and the, and the vision that I put into that. Um, but the problem is that as soon as people start to think, oh, well, if a monkey presses the button or any animal, then the photographer doesn't have copyright, and that's nonsense. It, it depends upon the facts of the story. And in this instance, with Wikipedia and a few other people, the facts are irrelevant to them. They'd seen something in the paper, and to them that was the truth. And they've stuck with that ever since. When you go to Wikipedia now, who've now hosted my shop for two years, promoting it to be taken for free, they continually but the source of the images is the Daily Mail. And when you read the Daily Mail article, it makes you think that a monkey grabbed the camera and took its own self-portrait without my intervention whatsoever. And that's the problem. Okay, so why, why, why did we hear a lot of noise about this a uh, couple of months ago? So what happened? Because it's been three years already. Well, it's been three years, yeah. I mean, it died down. But um, it was at the moment that I realised that Wikipedia had put it on their website. And at this time, I didn't even know about the, the, the Creative Commons issue. I thought, cheeky sods. Um, they haven't asked me permission to put it on, on Wikipedia. Um, but was, in, in the background, there was another group also um, um, arguing about the copyright on the picture. So I thought, I'd better get this taken down anyway. So I went through the, the Wikipedia US company. So I went through this, the, the, the US system, which is a pain in, the, in itself. They've created their, uh, an insular um, takedown system where you have to go through a piece of legislation to get any US company to take it down. Eventually I did that and Wikipedia agreed. You know, they, they asked questions and say, why, why, why am I claiming copyright in this? I told them the reasons and they accepted it. They took it down. And within a few days, I expect, and I wasn't really monitoring it very well at the time, but within a few days, I suspect, that that decision had been overturned by an individual editor or a group of editors, I don't really know, and, and put it back on there, despite my insistence that it was my copyright, despite some editors saying they agreed, there is an element within Wikipedia, obviously, that they think they are above the law. Hmm. 
And this is the this is the problem now. Wikipedia believe they are above the law. They don't care about it, what a judge is going to say. They're testing whether I've got the guts to take this to a court. They know that the American system is a problem for foreign photographers. Um, and they've got all the money, and I haven't. They know that. This, this, you know, this is the system that we're that photographers are facing now. So I, w I want to pick on something that you just said, um, that Wiki Wikipedia slash Wikimedia believes that they they own the law, they be, they, they're above the law. Uh, but uh, I, I, I seem to recur that a couple of weeks ago, uh, or three weeks ago, there was uh, something in the news uh, claiming that the decision had been made by the US uh, Copyright Office, stating that, well, um, David Slater does not own the right of the, the monkey. What's, what's the real deal there? Uh, well, again, that's Wikimedia. Um, I, I, I think they're getting scared because they, they know the story. It's been on my website since 2011, since the story broke. It's been in the Guardian newspaper in England. Uh, it's been in magazines. The true story, what I've just told you, Wikipedia have got an agenda. They are blinkered to the truth. They want to go along with the, the fact that this is Creative Commons and they want to make a story out of copyright. Um, I've lost my track now. <laughs> so, so, let me help you on this. Uh, so, has, um, has the US co uh, Copyright Office decided yeah. or not on this matter? No, they haven't. So, Wikipedia have now, um, in order to sideline people from the facts of and the journalists from, from the facts too, by claiming that the, the, the US Copyright Office in a draft compendium edition that's going to be uh, published in December of this year, um, wrote that they had debated my particular case and had come to the same conclusion as Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia were, 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 were going to journalists saying that this is the case, and it's not. It's another lie. Um, what actually has happened, it's a draft copy for guidelines for copyright office staff. It isn't law, it's not legislation. It's just for people in the office when they get a batch of photographs and people from around the world. There's a guideline as to straight away determine what is and what isn't copyrightable. And on page eight, straight away, they'd inserted a line. I mean, remember that the copyright, the US copyright, hadn't touched this thing for 30 years. And all of a sudden decided it would do. Um, and it wrote... A photograph taken by a monkey isn't a copyrightable work. Um, there's no um, clarification of what taken means. There's a preamble to that sentence that talks about authorship and creativity, but not what taking a photograph is. There's an Im implicit suggestion that taking a photograph is merely pressing the button. <laughs> um, so the, the US Copyright Office, in my opinion, are insulting. They're insulting not just to me, but to photographers in general, that, that the creation the creative aspect of a photograph is just simply pressing the button. Mm. Now remember that the, the, the photograph is now starting to be called a selfie. Yes. It's never a selfie. Selfie was a term that came in 2012. My, my photographs was a pre-arranged, um, um, very cleverly created uh, situation where a DSLR, a large you know, Canon 2,000 pounds worth of equipment, was put on a tripod with a cable release um, whereas a selfie is something that generally gets put on a little lightweight phone where you just press the button <laughs> and an amusing picture is taken and you post that on social media. So it seems almost that Wikipedia and US Copyright Office are now in cahoots to make the world think that photography is nothing more than pressing a button as though you're on a camera phone. They seem to di di uh, disregard all the creative elements, all the F numbers and the dial in, the ISO numbers. That serious photographers use, and I just think it's an insult. And I really hope that people watching this are going to go to the U.S. Copyright Office website and add their comments, which is very easily found. You can go to my website and my Facebook site and add your comment to this outrage uh, of how we are now being treated by the authorities and people like Wikipedia. And in fact, I'm actually showing here on the screen because I've seen I've seen the post on your. Uh Facebook page, uh, and for those of you who wants to uh, and should actually uh, like uh, and show your support to David uh, on um, on Facebook, uh, go there because sadly there are only sixty five likes on your page. That's criminal. 
That is. <laughs> I always complain I don't have enough, but 65, that's that's criminal. So, guys, please show your support. Go there. There's the address on your screen. Go there and click the like button, please. And uh, you'll find there's a link here that you guys see with my mouse uh, from the 17th of September. And there's a link where you can actually uh, go check it out, this whole story, on the uh, U.S. Copyright uh, Office. The... What... One of the feedback that I've seen or questions or uh, statements that I've seen from um, the worldwide reactions has been around questioning whether this whole story is kind of a publicity stunt. Uh, because today with celebrities, it's all about this, right? Making the buzz. And so questioning whether this whole thing is not just about making the buzz and that now uh, David Slater is more famous because of this Makagi that he ever was uh, before, is it all about money at the end, or what? What can you say about uh, to to those folks? Uh, uh, like I've already said, the the story uh, started in two thousand and eleven. Um, actually, when the photograph was actually taken um, by by the monkey, um, it didn't even occur to me that that was a story. I was just happy to have the image, and I wanted to use that image to put to my agents and to hopefully create a conservation story out of it. It wasn't about me making money. I wanted to make the, 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 the monkeys money. And it was nothing to do with me. The fact that Wikipedia, in the last month and a half, um, have made this a, a, another story. Uh, it wasn't of my life, my, my making. They've made the story. They're promoting themselves. Um, and yes, the, the, there's a silver lining to all of this. Yes, I am getting publicity. And it's generating a few more sales um, of prints, etc., but nothing like it should be. Um, in 2011, I, I'd done 100 prints in the first sort of couple of weeks. I might, might have made 10 prints in, in, in the last six weeks, simply because Wikipedia are telling the world, you can go to their site, take this image, do your own print. So nobody's interested in going via me. Mm. What is interesting, though, is that a lot of the newspapers are still buying the image from my agent. They are really not buying into the fact that the, it, it's Creative Commons, and they still honour the fact that I have copyrights, and that's why they go via my agent. So, despite what the papers can sometimes say against, and some of them are doing, um, they still come to me for the for the payment. So, one one thing that I find interesting is that yes, this is your story with this monkey, but I think your story uh, brings up a bigger picture, right? Mm. Uh, because we know that. Uh, especially on the wildlife photography world, mostly this one, uh, mm. because achieving the perfect shot can take days, weeks, and sometimes months because of seasons and so on. Photographers will not stay behind the bush all night long, all day long, all week long to get that shot. And, and it's common practice to rely on uh, movement sensors or yeah. um, of any kind to trigger uh, the photograph, and I'm thinking of the National Geographic magazine, for example, who, uh, pu which published a lot of uh, wildlife photography, and we could expect that, well, your story somehow uh, could impact or, or be revealing to, uh, to their future. So well, what's your take on this? Yeah, and I, I don't think people should ignore, ignore my particular story, as funny as it might be and interesting as it might be, because it does have a wider aspect. Um, the, the monkey pressed the cable release, and the cable release is a wire that's attached to the presser, uh, to the shutter button. Wildlife photographer, photographers for, for decades now have been using pressure pads with a wire connected to the trigger button, um, movement sensors, uh, trip wires, you name it, we, we've got it, the technology is there now. And it could equally be argued, as in my case, that an animal that steps on a pressure pad that takes up through a wire and it's the button, they're taking the photograph. The animal is taking the photograph. So, yeah, National Geographic photographer Steve Winter, who was one of the 2008 winners of Wildlife Photographer of the Year, um, very openly said that all his photographs were taken on camera traps. Then He wasn't there at the time. Um, it was a little bit of a debate at the time, but not, nothing like this. But, yeah, I wonder now whether the, 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 the mindset of people who think intellectual property should be free for the benefit of the community are now going to target photographs such as Steve Winters. Um, you know, your amateur photographers are taking pictures like this all the time. 
this is this is very affordable technology now. Um, so yeah, copyright law needs to be changed. We shouldn't be talking in terms of taking a photo but creating a photo. Um, and the copyright law needs to be brought into the 21st century. People got to realise that when the copyright law was written, particularly in the UK and the US, it was 30 years ago. It was only two, uh, six weeks ago when this story broke that the US actually started to look at rewriting it. And what did they rewrite? They put a couple of sentences in directly attacking my photograph. I mean, it, it's just totally insulting. So I'm hoping now, I'm, I'm contacting a lot of people in the copyright industry now. I'm hoping to maybe champion a bit of a, a change in copyright law. I mean, I'm learning a lot about the, the law. Um, I'm being sort of fo forced into it, actually. But it's, an, it, it's interesting, it's enjoyable. And hopefully people will get a bit back behind me, especially photographers, because even, even if they're not wildlife photographers, there are other things afoot to get your photographs. If you, if you have your image on Google and you haven't got it uh, assigned, it can't be traced back to you, they're going to have it, mate. <laughs> you know, the, people have been after them for years. Uh, if, if you've got your picture without accreditation or it's on your website or a blog and people want to use your blog, um, in, a, in their own news story, they're going to take it under what's called fair use. The protection we have now is dismal. And even when you think you have protection automatically through copyright law in your country, particularly the UK, uh, think again. Because if somebody from a foreign country, say China, Singapore, or whoever, takes your, your photograph off your blog, despite whether it's got a copyright notice on it or not, you've got to find a lawyer in that country and sometimes you've got to fight your rights under their laws and that's the case with the US and that I'm fighting. So that, that's it's, it's a good advice that you just um, implied there. Uh, mm. Very often one recurring topic is watermarks right and people uh, abuse them. <laughs> I think people are um, confusing copyrights watermarks with uh, a signature uh, as any artist would uh, would sign his uh, his artwork, mm -hmm. what's what's your take on this? Because I'm lo I'm looking at your website at the moment. I'm looking at the fantastic Secretary Bird uh, picture. It's fantastic bird, and I've noticed all the others. You don't, I don't see any watermark or visible watermark. Uh, so what what do you recommend we do, professional and amateurs? Because well, we're not going to spend money in lawyers and you know. Yeah. Um. The, it, it, there's, there's half advice. There's not good advice yet. I can only give half advice. The reason why some of my pictures haven't got copyright marks on is because they've been on there a long time. And like many other photographers, I never, never used to really worry about it. I'm a UK photographer, and copyright is automatic, or so you think. Yeah. And in, in a way, it is automatic. You do, you do have rights if you find an infringer. But finding an infringer these days and getting them into court or getting them to pay is, uh, is now impossible. It's a full-time job. Um, so, yeah, watermark your pictures by all means. I'd advise that people put them artistically, if you can, across the middle of the image so they can't be cropped off or cloned out. Um, I, I began my website thinking that would ruin the image, and, 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 and it does ruin the image, and that's sad. I mean, that we have to go and ruin our images just to protect our inherent rights. Um, but make sure that your imagery is traceable back to you and I'm not really sure yet how we do that that has to be updated in copyright are you are you thinking of um, just making sure that the metadata inside your uh, your image points to your website your name your pseudo copyright it's a good idea and it should work but uh, media outlets and Wikipedia in particular are now stripping all metadata even the editors no longer can see metadata so there's no, you know, it doesn't matter whether you put a copyright notice in there, an address, a telephone number. It's going to get stripped out before you know it. it. Goes on Google Images. Nobody knows who you are. Can't find you. It's going to go on Creative Commons. Okay, and just to uh, to wrap up on this uh, monkey thing, um, I've noticed that there is currently an offer um, for people who would like to officially uh, and respectfully. Uh, order a print, especially a canvas, of uh, of this macaque. And uh, can you tell us a bit about this? Because there is the offer we see. I discovered it on your uh, Facebook page, and then I went onto your website. 
uh, and there is some kind of a donation happening behind uh, on the background of this, right? So can you can you tell us more about this? Yeah, well, clearly I've lost all, all rights to my, photog my, my photographs now. I'm not really making any money of it. And very kindly, a, a European, a German print company um, approached me who sympathised with my uh, plight, but also are very much into conservation. And they said that if I'm willing to give them permission to use the photograph, on a canvas, they would give a canvas away to free to anybody who ordered it and go to my website to get one of these. You only have to pay postage, which is only about eight pounds. In fact, you don't even need to get the selfie, if you want to call it a selfie. You can put your own image on. It's a way to get a, a canvas with your own print on it. Um, and they will donate a pound or a dollar, just over a dollar, for every canvas order. And hopefully if we get tens of thousands of pounds or tens of thousands of orders, sorry, um, we will generate tens of thousands of pounds to actually go directly to the uh, conservation group that's mentioned on my website. All right. Well, that's fantastic. And as I said at the beginning of this video, I am uh, ordering it uh, today. So hopefully uh, I'll, I'll get it soon and I'll show it to everyone. But I'm hoping that I'm not going to be the only one. Uh, mm. And I think... Your story is uh, inspiring. Uh, your work uh, is is inspiring. I mean, suffice to say, uh, just going through here, just looking at different uh, African raptors that we see here. We've got fish, eagle. Um, talked about this secretary, uh, but you don't only do this. So I'm going back to um, your gallery because it's really, yeah, really rich. Those are old photographs. Those are old. So in fact, yeah, you're saying it's all photographs. So what's well, what's your pro what's your latest project? Um, well, I mean, to be, to be honest, I've got no money to go to exotic places at the moment, uh, and I've just had a daughter. She's 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 just gone to school, so I've I've been a bit lax on the tropical forest front. But my passion for the last three years is to be save to save. I've set up a conservation group um, in my hometown or in my home area to save the wild boar oh. in, in the UK. Um, it's a very controversial species that needs a lot of help, and I'm one of the probably the forefront of the uh, photography of, the, of wild boar in Britain. Um, so yeah, I get a lot of media interest in that, uh, and it's an ongoing project. They're being slaughtered uh, all the all the time now um, for for money, for sport, for bloodlust, um, and they're, they're a very vital um, species. If you care anything about ecosystems, and soil. Uh, and forests, um, so hopefully people can help me on that as well. Hmm. And I see, um, I see some amazing uh, photograph uh, taken in Norway. Um, how about Wales? Because you live in Wales. Uh, I just moved to Wales, yeah. So how's the um, how's the landscape there? Surely full of potential, right? <laughs> it is. It's full of rain as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's full of snow. I mean, I, you know, I, I've been into in, in Snowdonia, the Brecon Beacons, for many, many years. I do take landscape photographs. It's not what I'm I'm known for. But, yeah, and there's lots of animals here. I mean, uh, I, I used to live in the forest thing where the wild boar are. I'm only 13 miles away now. Um, lots of species to go out wherever you go. Always look for the wildlife on your doorstep. All right. Well, that's a, that's a good conclusion to this uh to this video so thank you again David for taking the time to um, to give us your side of the story which uh, which differs greatly from uh, what the media have been uh, saying uh, and I'm I'm really hoping that you you get out of this misery uh, that this uh, this story has, uh, has brought upon you and hopefully for the be for the greater good as well for the rest of us you don't need to be a pro to uh, to fully appreciate the whole copyright um, issue here so yeah. thanks again, and for those of you who are watching, well, until next time, this is Tommy Good saying, if you like it, well, capture it. Watch out. Watch out for your copyright. Bye.